My truth and my mercy are with him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The words of the offertory verse of the ancient Mass of today's feast of St. Leo II, confessor and pope. Today we commemorate the day within the octave of St. Peter and Paul. The last gospel is taken from the octave of the Holy Apostles, the third collect of the Blessed Virgin Mary. After Mass, we continue with our devotion of the 13 Tuesdays of St. Anthony. Today's feast day has an interesting history, the Mass does, and it shows how God the Holy Ghost is always guiding the liturgy of the Roman Church. There was once such a very great devotion to Pope uh, St. Leo the Great, whose feast, it was the day of his death, is uh, April the 11th, that there were two feast days celebrated of this great defender of Rome against the barbarians. And the second feast day fell on the 28th of June, just before St. Peter and Paul, the church associated the, the, uh, St. Peter with his great successor, St. Leo. And that was the day on which the relics of St. Leo were enshrined within the Basilica of the Vatican. But later on with time, as it happened, another great successor of the Apostles, St. Leo II, died on the 28th of uh, June, and um, the feast day, which was had been marked for centuries as St. Leo II, the second, meaning the second time, came to serve instead for the second Pope, St. Leo, and St. Leo the Great reverted to his original feast day in April. Later on in the 1920s, in order to honor St. Irenaeus, who was another champion of the, of the papacy, uh, then his feast was put on, on that day, and uh, our saint was moved to a day within the octave to the 3rd of July. He is a saint, Pope uh, Leo II is, of great doctrinal firmness, as we shall see, but also a saint very devoted to the sacred liturgy. He was a Sicilian by birth and a musician. He composed or corrected some of the hymns and the Gregorian chant of the Catholic Church. And finally, he was a saint of very great devotion and love for the poor, the, the, the widows, orphans, not only by his uh, command, but also by his personal example. But it is especially interesting to us to see how God used this saint in order to drive out the remnants of heresy. You see, what had happened was that the heretics for a long time had been trying to deny the truth of our Lord's human nature. The devil is always attacking either that our lady is not truly the mother of God or that our Lord is not truly our brother by having assumed a true human nature of our Lady. So, first of all came the heresy of the Monophysites, and they said that our Lord just has one nature and not two, kind of a combined nature. That's the heresy that's held by the, the Copts today and the Armenians. We should pray for their conversion. Then came a time of supposed peace. The Council of Chalcedon, great Saint Leo the First, Saint Leo the Great, uh, proclaimed the Catholic faith, and it seemed that everything was quiet and calm. But as Dom Garanger points out in his in his uh, writings for today's saint, what happens, and we saw it happen the same thing with the condemnation of modernism, that when the heresy is openly condemned, St. Pius X, for example, condemning modernism 100 years ago, what happens is not that the heresy goes away, but that it goes underground and it subverts in a quiet way and continues its path. The ancient heresy against the truth of our Lord's human nature then reared its ugly head again during the time of St. Leo II, and it was a little bit of a compromise. Now they were saying that our Lord didn't have a real human will. In other words, that his human nature wasn't really human. And that would, of course, give the lie to the prayer of our Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane. Father, not my will, but thine be done. So there was another council held at Constantinople and another great proclamation of Catholic truth. And St. Leo actually went so far as to condemn the weakness or the complicity of his predecessor, Pope Honorius. Not that Honorius had fallen into heresy, as is falsely claimed by many in their ignorance, but rather that he unfortunately allowed himself to be tricked 
into keeping a kind of a, of a silence that was truly unworthy of the successor of an apostle. But St. Leo II, you might say, restored everything in a very beautiful way and restored the full luster of the apostolic see. He's a good saint then to pray to against secret heresy, which goes underground and eventually will in time rear its ugly head again. And a good saint to pray to as well with Saints Peter and Paul for the restoration of the apostolic see of St. Peter. St. Anthony, the saint whom we honor during the Tuesdays of summer, St. Anthony testified to his devotion to the see of St. Peter by going as an envoy of the Franciscan general chapter to see the Holy Father, Pope Gregory the Ninth. They wanted to ask the Pope for permission to make certain changes in the primitive rule of St. Francis, uh, and this is especially at the impetus of St. Anthony, to uh, make the to permission to have churches and to have uh, schools and uh, to make the monastery a little bit more substantial, to adjust to what the church really needed the Franciscans to be in their day. And the Holy Father graciously gave his permission to St. Anthony and the Franciscans for those proper adjustments. Um, and then he heard St. Anthony preach in St. Peter's. And he was so taken with his preaching style, which